Hello, everyone. My name is Tom, um, the seventh. They call me Tom Seven, some of them. And um, I'm just some guy who did a funny project. I'm like the former pre presenter is a recovering academic. Uh, this is not an academic presentation, but I hope it is still illuminating and entertaining for you. Uh, so the topic of the talk is, I'm going to keep going back over here. Uh, learn fun and play fun, which is two pieces of software I wrote on a lark, uh, which automate the playing of old video games. And the goal here is definitely not to do this in a good way. I'm not trying to publish a paper. Uh, I'm not trying to um, succeed at playing video games. I don't really care about rescuing the princess, unless I do it with style. Yes? What? No. It, uh, old video games, I guess Call of Duty is pretty old now. But um, no, this is, this is specific to the Nintendo Entertainment System and video game systems that are very uh, small by modern standards. And I'll explain why, although the techniques conceivably could apply to uh, Call of Duty in the far future. Uh, so the design goals here, again, is not to be really good at the game, but to do so in an amusingly general, mathematically elegant, and stupid technique um, stu way. And I'm basically, you may have seen this, uh, this video. It was a somewhat popular video online, and there's a follow-up video. You can watch them, and I encourage you to. Uh, those have sort of better comedic timing, maybe. But, uh, and more of the same kind of stuff. Here, I know this is more or less a computer science audience, I hope. And so I'm going to actually talk a bit about how the algorithms work. But there is a section at the end of, um, of it succeeding and failing in humorous or perhaps impressive or ways that make you despair. So. Uh, and I think it's a little bit of a short talk based on um, my feelings. So save your questions and do ask questions at the end, OK? I'll try to go slow. This is a really hard thing for me to go slow. I want to talk about Sigbovic. Sigbovic, so this work, again, is not like real academic work. I just did it um, for the fun of the hack. And if you like that kind of thing, Sigbovic, so this is originally published in Sigbovic, which is a conference we have every year at CMU. Um, and these are some of the titles of former of projects that I did in the past. Wikipedia, the free programming language that anyone can edit. It was a thing I really built. And you, this audience might actually like that one. Maybe I should have talked about that instead. Um, what words ought to exist is sort of the philosophical follow-on to the last talk that we just saw. You Keep Dying um, is, a, is a video game about dying uh, a lot. And uh, Who's the Biggest Douche in Sky Mall is a, applying some important techniques in machine learning to figure out who is the douchiest of them all. In that uh, so do check that out, and you know, or write a paper for it, or whatever. But just so you get a sense of where I'm coming from with this work. Okay, so the Nintendo Entertainment System. This is the best video game system. Um, it's certainly, if you're my age, you must know that. And if you're too, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if you're a Call of Duty player, just go back to the classics every once in a while and, and understand where gaming came from. What's awesome about the the NES, given that it stole so many years of my life, to me is how tiny this computer is. So it's the Ricoh 2A03 processors, tiny processor. You could like look at the traces of the transistors with a magnifying glass. That's how small it is. 2,048 bytes of RAM, 2 kilobytes. This is 2,048 pixels. I probably should have made this black and white, because there's actually red, green, and blue uh, color channels here. So this is three times the information content of a Nintendo <laughs> on the screen. Okay. Uh, and it runs at 1.79 megahertz. So like, roughly speaking, my home computer, which is a beast, can fit 32 million Nintendos in RAM at once without compression, any fancy techniques, 32 million, and runs, what, like 4,000 times faster than that on each of its 12 cores. So like, <laughs> this is what originally inspired me to do, to do this project, just the thought that like, I was getting all that entertainment out of this joke of a computer by modern standards. What if I had a really big computer doing all of that stuff like in parallel or whatever. So uh, oh, some more primers about the Nintendo Entertainment System. So there are eight inputs, which is so it's an 8-bit processor. Uh, it's no coincidence that there are eight inputs. And so that's like the, essentially the entire space over which we're going to search uh, for a single player, just those eight buttons. And yes, that was the Konami code, in case you're trying to figure it out. Um, <laughs> And one of the really nice things about having 2,048 bytes of RAM is programmers just wrote these things in assembly very straightforwardly. And they wrote programs where there's a global variable called like Mario's X coordinate on the screen. And that's literally where it is. It's at hex address 86. Um, and other stuff like, well, the, the first level consists of a series of screens, each stored in ROM. So there's a lot of ROM. There's many, many kilobytes of ROM. Maybe Mario's like 64 kilobytes of ROM 
but the RAM is small. And so it would tell you which sort of page in this level are you on, and that's stored at 6D. And uh, there's other stuff like the level you're on, which is you know, world 1-1, one -one, is world 1, level 1. So those are stored in RAM somewhere, the number of coins, the number of lives. Not all of that stuff's on screen, some of it's on screen. Sometimes there's the decimal representation for the screen display, sometimes there's the hex, res uh, hex thing in, in memory. But the important lesson is, these games were not written in a fancy way, okay? There's just a variable that says how many coins you have. So the thought is, like, what does it mean to win a game? And I want to do this in general for all games. And the simplest possible thing I could think of would be, well, these bytes should be going up. Because actually, all of the things I talked about there, right? Like the level, it's good if that goes up. The world, it's good. You know, coins, want more coins, right, all the time, more lives. I even want my screen to get higher, and I want my x coordinate to get higher, right? So like, if the RAM is going up, I must be winning the game. Which, now, you laugh, but this is going, this is going to actually work, right? And that's the, that's the joke. And it's, it's a little bit more complicated. Actually, it's a lot more complicated. But still, I think pretty elegant. Um, not bytes, but sequences of bytes in lexicographic orderings. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's just think about the world level pair. I go from 1-1 one, one to 1-2. One, so that byte went up. Then 1-3, that byte went up. 1-4. But now, actually, 4 went down to 1. But there's another byte uh, that went up, which is my world byte. So as long as I know, if I'm thinking about the world and the level together, it's OK that my level went back down to 1 because my world went up. And that's the familiar, I hope, not notion of a lexicographic ordering. And it generalizes so many concepts in video games that are very simple, like Super Mario Brothers. Like, the pair of your world and level is a really good predictor, as we just talked about. The world, the level, then the screen number, and then your x coordinate within a screen is also a really good uh, metric for how far you've gone or your lives and your coins, because when you get 100 coins, you get an extra life. Or like the first, second, and third, and fourth bytes of a multi-byte thing like your score, no matter whether it's in uh, big or little or some kind of weird uh, interleaved in, uh, endianness, something like that. So it's nice, right? That you can spell out a lot of metrics on a, on a game's progress using lexicographic orderings on locations in memory. So the idea is, uh, what if I could figure out by watching a person play the game, it's going to be me, uh, how, what does it mean to win that game? And I could do that by modeling it as these lexicographic sequences. And then I can use that in order to play the game automatically. Okay? So that's what I'm going to talk about for the remainder of the talk. Um, learn fun is that first part. That's the thing that's going to learn what lexicographic orderings are mean uh, are for this game to be winning. That was a really awkward sentence that I apologize for. And then the other half is going to use those to play the game. So basically, this is me playing Super Mario Brothers. I record some sequence of me playing for like a minute, and I produce those, uh, those orderings. They're not actually those. I don't know what they mean, right? They're just going to be the addresses that I observed having these properties of going up. And this is why we're trying to close the shades. I designed for a darker room. There's some faint red text here, which is the uh, which is the weights. So there's actually not just the orderings, but they're weighted, just for full disclosure. And then I'm going to use those objective functions to search for a sequence of inputs that wins the game. And to be clear, this search happens offline. Conceivably, if I had fast enough computer, I could do this, and you could just watch it happen. But this is kind of an overnight affair. It's not a, it's not absurdly slow. And I, I'm talking about like if I had 10 computers like mine, then I could run this real time. And so PlayFun takes those weighted uh, objective functions and produces uh, inputs that win the game or jump in the pit. You know, sometimes it does that. And that was something that it really did. So what do I mean by search? Um, the title of this paper in Sigbovic was the first level of Super Mario Brothers is easy with lexicographic orderings, which we talked about, and time travel. And this is the time travel part. So, and this is, this, this is the reason why this approach is least useful, okay? It specifically requires that I'm able to emulate the Nintendo in order to know what would happen if I did a specific thing. And the Nintendo, because it's a simple computer, I can just simulate it on my computer. And I can save a state, and I can try out a series of inputs and see what would happen, all right? And that's not true of most uh, problems that we want to solve, sadly. Some problems. So for example, I have some state. Here I am at the beginning of world 1-1. One, one. And here's the state where I do nothing, or the input where I do nothing. And basically, I just kind of stand there, and the Goomba gets closer. And that's the state where I press the A button, and I start jumping up, and I get the coin. Um, and I can take each of those, and I can explore them further 
Uh, this is like assuming there's only two possible inputs. There's actually a lot of inputs that I could do at any given step. So I have this whole tree, right? So I could search that tree, and I could say, well, here I've gotten down to some state. How good is that state according to those lexicographic orderings compared to the first one or compared to those other ones to decide whether I'm making progress, right? Sadly, um, you can't use brute force. You can't just search this space, right? So one second of gameplay is the frames per second to the two to the number of inputs. Because I could press A and write at the same time, right? So the power set of those buttons, which is 6 to the 256, which is that number for one second. And it's not even like I just have to do that for every second. It's actually the product of those. So it's a ridiculous number, right? There's no way you could brute force this thing. Um, so you have to be kind of smart about it. And in the rest of the talk, I just want to tell you about how Learn Fun works, how Play Fun works, and then I'm going to show you videos of it, um, of it playing. And the videos, by the way, if you have seen this online, I'm going to show you some new stuff. So uh, hopefully it won't be all repetition. And I'm taking 10 minutes. Yeah, this will be good. I'm worried about going too fast. So let's talk about Learn Fun. Learn Fun is the thing that produces those lexicographic orderings. So the input is a series of RAMs, a time series of RAMs. And I'm going to say RAMs. I know it sounds really wrong, but it, it is RAMs because it's like the RAM at frame 1, the RAM at frame 2, the RAM at frame 3. Uh, and those are pictures of like actual Super Mario Brothers RAMs in black and white this time. And the output is the, lex the lexicographic orderings. I take about 4,000 frames in, and I output about 250 orderings so that you get a sense of what that's like. And uh, this problem can be solved exactly. This is actually a nice mathematical problem. In fact, it, it's a nice exercise if you want to figure out how to do this. But I'm just going to belabor it. Uh, so basically what you do is you non-deterministically non -deterministically select an ordering um, L, the script L, that's obeyed by those RAMs, which, by which I mean that like, each RAM is less than or equal to the next RAM according to this ordering. And additionally, there'll be some properties that L will have. It'll be quote unquote tight and maximal. I just made up those words. Uh, so <laughs> like if you're studying lexicographic orderings and you don't know what I'm talking about, that's why. Um, <laughs> this, is what, this is what I take those to mean. A tight one means that every location in L, so remember, L is like the world, the level, the x coordinate, and your coins, or something like that. It means that every location that's in L was used at some point in the, in the process of those RAMs to discriminate some pair of RAMs. Because, it, for example, if I have a byte in my input that's always 0, like it's just, you know, whatever, byte 19 is always 0, then I could say, yeah, 19 is part of my ordering, but I don't have any evidence that 19 is interesting. And it will be obeyed by all of those RAMs, because it'll always be 0, so it'll always be less than or equal at that byte. So I ensure that um, somewhere I at least saw the lives go up, and that was the only thing that went up in order to make me think that these uh, memories are less than or equal to. So that's important. Otherwise, you get a bunch of bytes that are not useful in your ordering. And then maximal maybe is not important, but I have this constraint anyway, which is that you can't add anything else on the end in the least significant position um, and still be valid and tight. So like, you have to have exploited all of the memory addresses that you know about that are obeyed in this ordering in order to be done. Right? Sort of makes sense? And uh, the algorithm is, this is like the one slide of the algorithm. Um, basically, you're just going to take a tight and valid L, some any one, and you're going to non-deterministically extend it with some new location in its lowest, uh, least significant position um, until you can't do that anymore, which therefore means that it's maximal, right, by definition that we just talked about. And uh, what we'll do is we'll start with the empty sequence because that is you know, like basically everything is going to be equal or less than or equal to. And um, it is valid because there's, of course, everything is less than or equal with the, with the empty ordering. And it's tight because a, quantif a for all quantifier over the empty list is uh, trivially satisfied. So a location x extends l if this is establishing tightness. And if you're very good at reading faint red text, you can see it says tight there and valid there. Spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> <laughs> For, there must exist some pair of RAMs, R, I, and the next one, R, I plus 1, where basically it's equal on the prefix, but this particular um, byte makes it strictly less than. So somewhere this had to be the deciding factor. Um, and it's only the deciding factor if that's equal on the prefix, not less than. And then for all pairs, uh, if it's equal on the prefix, then it has to be less than or equal to. And we're only talking again about equality here because that's the nature of lexicographic orderings. When the world has gone up, 
I don't care about anything that's less important than that in the ordering, for example, the level. Level can do anything like go down if the world went up. Okay? So that's a nice, um, that's a nice algorithm, and you can code it up, and you could get your underguys to do it, or uh, especially if you have a nice functional programming language, it's like, it's a breeze, it's a delight to write. I use C++ like a chump because, uh, first of all, I'm a chump, but second of all, I was working in a, this emulator called FCE Ultra, which is written in C. And so like, I, didn't re I could have tried to bind ML bindings or something for it, but it's not that bad. Now, some things to know about the generation of these lexicographic orderings. Um, this is me playing again. And when I'm playing this game, I don't always go strictly to the right. Right is winning, for sure. That's the way you go in Super Mario Brothers. Every kid knows. But like here, I'm struggling to get up to this, uh, to this flower, and I go back to the left. And this would, the algorithm that I just showed you would think, well, most of the time he goes up, but I just found a place where this goes down. Mm, invalid can't be one of the orderings. And I graphed that over there with, uh, it's, it's, I, I couldn't put x, the x coordinate on the y axis, so it's, it's got a really strange shape. So it, you get it. You go left. It's not um, strictly valid. So what I do is I actually chunk up the memory. Um, I have a couple different approaches. One of them is just try the whole memory as the input. But I can also look at, for example, just the first tenth of the input and look at orderings that are obeyed there. Or I could look at every tenth frame so that things that sort of gradually go up over time but are momentarily violated are likely to be caught by one of these thingies, right? And. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that was a reminder to myself to fix that because that's not true. But that was also some way of producing the weights. Okay, so I also have to decide because, for example, like let's say I found an ordering that was obeyed for these white stripes here, but in between there was like a real lot of going left sorts of stuff. I would want that to count against that uh, ordering in a soft way. So there's some approach for weighting them that this slide is totally misleading about. So I'm just skip it. And this is a graph of these are my inputs over time of playing Super Mario Brothers. And each one of these colors is a different uh, lexicographic ordering that was produced by what I just talked about. And they go up, as you'd expect. But there are ones that are momentarily violated. So like this blue one, this teal one here goes and then sort of vibrates. And um, then it's good again. And so like it probably was ignoring this section of the game when it was being trained. But that's good because you know some points I'm swimming, and swimming might look a little different than running, and I still want to learn about swimming. OK? So now we're going to talk about searching. Then we're going to watch a movie. OK, good. Searching for a sequence of moves that maximize the objective function. So actually, what I just talked about was learn fun, and that's more or less the whole story. It's a simple program. And that program, uh, once it's done, I can throw out everything having to do with the game. Like it, I'll never again look at um, you know, the pictures or anything like the sound or anything on the screen. I'm really just looking at RAMs and, in fact, only at the addresses that appear in these lexicographic orderings in order to do the search. So this is the hard part of the program. And this is the part that I spent most of my time on, maybe unwisely. So the space is huge, as we talked about. There's like ridiculous expon exponents in there. Um, and 60 frames a second, right? Uh, and it's mostly tree-shaped. So unlike you know, lots of game search, like chess, for example, you can permute moves and get back to the same state. In this, the Nintendo's got all sorts of timers. It's got the music. It's got pseudo-random number generators in it. So you basically never, uh, it's not usually the case that if you jump and then walk right, you'll be in the same state as if you walked right and then jumped, right? So it's basically a tree. Um, Simulating steps is actually fairly slow. It takes about 500 microseconds. I know that doesn't sound that slow, but um, it's kind of slow. So you have to be careful to not simulate a step unless you're going to use that output. And uh, you want to keep making progress, because I'm never going to actually rescue the princess in this. And I wouldn't even know what rescuing the princess is, because the training data doesn't contain that. And so I want to make sure that it's playing the game and not just uh, being paralyzed, looking for a good solution when, one, when it can't find one. Okay. So that's like where this algorithm kind of comes from. Uh, in, in other words, you can't just use A stars to throw something in. For all I know, some academics have some great way to do this, and that's great for them. But I like to invent stuff. That's fun, right? Um, oh, good. We got sound and everything. So this was the very first approach, by the way. Just pick this, the input that makes the objective functions go up the most on the next frame. And these are, the, these are like what it's pressing. So it's just like. And. <laughs> And that's what Mario does. And it just does that until the game ends. And probably somewhere, someone's like, worst player ever. 
we'll see some more funny, uh, funny things in a bit. So the algorithm looks like this. Basically, I, I, you need a little bit more long-term planning. And the algorithm is kind of the mix, the typical mix of tactics and strategy that you see in this kind of thing, right? So there's going to be some exhaustive search over the tactics, the things I'm going to do very next, right now. Um, what person, buttons am I going to press in the next five frames? And some like planning of what am I going to do later? But again, we have no idea what's happening in the game. So like forming a high-level plan is sort of ridiculous. All we can do is take two states and decide which one is greater than the other based on lexicographic like, ordering, right? OK, so what I do is I have roughly 40 different random sequences that are about 300 inputs. That's five seconds in length. And I just randomly generate those. Um, I randomly generate them according to a model that I'll mention in a bit. Then I'm going to do an exhaustive search over some short sequences and use those futures to decide which of those, um, which of those next states look good to me. Okay, so you know, in chess, for example, if you want to evaluate a chess state, you can look at the, pl the pieces on the board. I don't get to do that. I don't understand the board. But you can at least simulate chess moves, like random play or something, and see what happens. And I can do that. So I'm just simulating random play to see how good a state is. Like, am I about to fall in a pit? Um, and this has the uh, pros that it allows me to uh, evaluate those, those states. It allows me to maintain some kind of coherence of the plan over time, because I'm looking like five seconds in ahead of time. And it allows me to reinforce and vary ideas that are that shown to be good. Okay? And this one I'm going to try to explain. I think this is a new algorithm. I don't know. Uh, Basically, so here's the 40 futures. Imagine that this goes to f sub 40. And it's, it, the future is just a series of inputs. Okay? Um, and you're currently looking at some state, for example, the beginning of Super Mario Brothers. And what we're going to do is we're going to chop off the first five if, inputs. It's literally five. Of course, you could change that number if you wanted, uh, of each of those sequences. And those are going to be called the nexts. So these are the things that I might do next. I'm going to just exhaustively search over those. Uh, and I'm going to decide which one's the best, and then I'm going to do that. And the way I do that is, oh, I also have to, let's save the tails, everything that comes after those next, and we'll call those the tails, because we're going to use those in a bit. Um, so the goal is to pick the best, the best next and commit to it. And what I'll do is I'll take that, any one of them, I'm going to do this for all of them, and I'm going to run it. So now I'm in a new state. OK, this is the result state. Right? Makes sense. In fact, that's really all I can do is run a state. Um, I just shrank it. And then for that frame, I'm going to take all of the tails for all of the futures, and I'm going to try all of those out given this state. Okay? And I get what are called the ends, all those different ends. Now I can do things like say, is this state greater than this state? Or is this state greater than that state? Okay. Um, sorry, I have to keep walking back and forth. There's this thing on the screen, but I like the dynamic uh, walking around. Um, and then I'm going to choose the best result, the best next, uh, according to whatever of those ends is the max. So like the, the best state that I can get to given that. And it's not like, it, so it's not like an average or anything like that. And that's a, that was unintuitive to me until I had a, a realization. This is kind of like, OK, so for example, let's say I die in all of the states except for one. So like I'm about to jump on some lava. But in one of them, I like just barely eke it out. You might think that this is a dangerous state. And a human would think of that as pretty dangerous. Like, don't go near the lava, because random play tends to kill you. And I initially started that way. But what I actually changed it, what I realized is, it's kind of like Minimax, right, where you have an opponent, except you don't have an opponent, because you can make the Goombas do anything you want by just exactly pressing the right way. So as long as I have one good move, it doesn't matter if I'm going to die in all of the rest of them. Because nothing can ever force me to do something uh, to make a bad move in the future if I know a good move. So it's really just max over those, over those results. And um, an important fact is that every next is evaluated with its tail from that first thing where we split them up. Um, so I at least will get to see again uh, any given thing that I've hallucinated doing in the future, I will have the opportunity to keep seeing it over and over and over again. So I'll never have to do worse than that. OK? I don't know if that makes sense. Whatever. Uh, OK, so the other thing that I do, and this is almost done, is all of these tails which get evaluated for each of the nexts, um, if they are bad somehow, according to this ordering, they get a score that's negative. And if they're good, they get a score that's positive. So that every tail, I kind of have a sense of how good is this future plan? 
Like, is this a plan where I tend to die? On no matter what I do now, I'm going to die later. And I do that so that I can keep these futures uh, to, be, to be more or less good. Because the better they are, the better it plays. And then I come back to this screen. I decided that that purple one was my favorite. So I commit to it, right? So now I'm just like moving forward in the game. I eliminate the ones with the lowest scores. These slide over. OK, so I'm about to restart. And before I do so, I fill out the missing ones uh, with perhaps mutated, perhaps random, perhaps mutated versions of the best ones. Okay. So in this one tiny sense, this is kind of a genetic algorithm. I don't consider this a genetic algorithm, but um, you know, I guess so. And then you have to extend these with random play so that you keep that 300 frame look ahead. And that's it. And I just keep doing that, um, et cetera. And that's actually the more or less the core idea of the search. There are some things, I'm going to mention these for uh, posterity, and you can look at these in the paper. They're explained pretty well in the paper, which is on tom7.org slash Mario. Uh, there's weighting of the random inputs. So purely random inputs are terrible. It's, if, if I did purely random inputs, then half of the time I'd be pressing the start button, right? And half of the time I'd be pressing the start button, and, or quarter of the time, start button and select button at the same time, which is n like no game. That's, a, that's never a good idea. So uh, I actually look at what, the, what, I pl what I pressed when I was playing the game, and that forms some model for how to generate them randomly. Pretty straightforward. Um, I also, as the game is playing, it reweights that, that model so that if it finds that it likes short button presses more than me, than I did, it can sort of learn that over time. And sometimes this leads to awesome and, uh, awesome and absurd behavior where it's pressing the buttons extremely fast. I'll show you an example of that in a bit. There's this backtracking thing, which I'm not sure if it was a good idea, but every couple hundred frames, it just runs way back and says, if I play randomly, like, did I get myself in a bad spot via some, um, via some I don't know, bad idea? I don't know if that's a good idea, but it's explained in the paper. There's some system stuff here. So there's this, some clever state caching and compression techniques to store a lot of these in RAM. And um, because FCEUX is just relentlessly bad software, it has like global variables called foo that are fundamental to the way that the software works. Like, you cannot make this thing multi-threaded. So the only thing I could do is make it multi-process. And so you have a bunch of different um, you know, processes on my machine running. Uh, using TCP IP. The nice thing about that is they actually run this on many computers at once if I want. All this stuff was just on my home machine, one home machine. Um, and that thing's called MarioNet, which is a double entendre that I'm a little bit proud of, so I'll just throw that in there. And now I want to talk to you about, or not talk to you, I want to show you a demo. And so let's do that.